The Supreme Court today ruled on several different things. Um, we're going to start from least bad and go to most bad, okay? Start with least bad and go to most bad. So, folks. The Supreme Court has ruled in the case uh, regarding January 6th rioters. Essentially, this was a case brought by a guy named Joseph Fisher. Now, Joseph Fisher was convicted for obstructing an official proceeding as part of his, the, his litany of January 6th charges. And the Supreme Court has voted six to three in order to throw out the obstruction charge. Because essentially the text of the obstruction charge is, let me grab it here. Uh, any, it applies to anyone who obstructs, influences, or impedes any official proceeding or attempts to do so. The main rub here is that SCOTUS ruled that an earlier line in the, uh, in the law basically limits the provision of obstruction here to altering or destroying records. So they're trying to say you can only get an obstruction charge of this type if you are trying to alter or destroy records while, you know, uh, in, in influencing, obstructing, or impeding an official proceeding. Now... What this means is not that like everything is like ev all of the January 6th rioters are off the hook, just that for these specific charges that were applied to some, but not all January 6th rioters, um, it's getting kicked down to a lower court, essentially for the lower court to decide whether or not uh, the newly interpreted statute applies for charges so basically the supreme court throws out the charges but then it goes to a lower ch uh, lower court to decide whether or not the revised understanding of the law applies that charge again so that's kind of where that's going it's kind of a weird thing it my rule on this is that um I can kind of I I can kind of understand it. You know, like the law was made uh in response to the Enron scandal. Like it was intended to um it was intended to go after people who are like trying to obstruct official investigations by like destroying records, which is something that was done a lot in the Enron scandal. Like that, that, and that's a whole bag of worms that we're not going to get into right now. But uh, bag of worms? Bag of worms is a saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bag of worms, not just a can. It, the worms come in many different containers. Shrug and bug knows what I'm talking about as a bug. Uh, a whole bag. Look, you can get small bags. Anyway. So... While it sound, while this court decision sounds bad on its face, I can kind of understand like Justices Sotomayor going in in like the affirmative, like yeah, let's toss this out direction. I, I can understand that, and I actually think that this is not like the worst ruling by any means. It's just kind of when you look at the headlines, it does seem like. You know, oh, they're throwing out the charges of January 6th rioters. That does seem really bad. You know, that's not a good headline. It attracts a lot of attention, but it conveys the wrong message of kind of what's going on. So we'll have to see what the follow-up lower courts do in response to this. A thermos of worms? Yeah. A, ca a casket of worms? Jesus, we're getting dark. All right. So, I'm here to tell you, it seems bad. You don't actually have to worry about that one um, too much. 
then what does it mean? It it just it just more narrowly uh, interprets the law. So because it was being used very widely to apply to so many January 6th rioters. I still think that you can make an argument under the more narrowly defined, sorry, the more narrowly defined law. I think you can make the argument that they were trying to alter the records of the election because they were trying to delay the, uh, you know, the, the, the recording of the, the votes. Um, so I think you can still make this case. It's just that the charges are more narrowly tailored so that it's not just like they're, you know, it, it, it can't be widely applied in the future to people. And I think that might actually be a good thing. Um, the next one that we have to talk about, though, is a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit worse. It's a little bit worse. Um, yeah. So the Supreme Court. Ruled uh, essentially today. We uh, can I pull up a better article because this is not giving me what I need. OK, there we go. So here's here's the other one, guys. Supreme Court upholds ban on sleeping outdoors in homelessness case. So basically. From here on out. Your city. Can ban homelessness, it can be it can now be a crime. For you to be poor and homeless. It, like that, that's just. A ban on sleeping outside in, in any city. Yes, it, it doesn't matter if there if there's no support structure, it doesn't matter if there's no housing, it doesn't matter if um, it, it doesn't matter. How do you ban homelessness? You make it a crime to be sleeping outside. You make it a crime to, uh, you know, sleep outdoors after a certain time. You know, that's how you ban homelessness. And they, the Supreme Court has now said that you can, it is not, it, it is constitutionally allowable for cities to ban homeless people. And guys, there's no way this goes well. There, there's no, there's no good outcome here. Um, this is basically just kicking every fight down to the city level. The, the, again, this is why you guys need to get into local politics. You need to get involved, show up at your city council meetings, because things, things like your city council meetings are now going to determine who gets to live and die in your community. You know, it, it's literally a life or death question. You know, the... In in my head, there like I, I think last winter or maybe the winter before that, we we covered a story about a a single city councilman who was able to save the lives of like a, a dozen homeless people because he opened the senior center for them to sleep in. Like the, these are the these are the actual stakes we're talking about when we're talking about you know getting involved in local politics now, and I think that with this court decision. It's now it's now even more dire, even more necessary to get involved in your local politics. Show up at your city council meetings, your town halls, etc. Because like if you don't. Republican dipshits who just want homeless people gone by any means necessary are going to show up. Like. It, this is honestly a worst case scenario, like a worst case scenario. Like they are. How do I put this? When you are offering cities a solution to homelessness, and I say solution here with the biggest air quotes imaginable. They're they're going to look at that and they're going to say, 
Well, actually, we don't have to build any homeless shelters. We don't have to build any affordable housing, you know, because we can just make it illegal for you to be homeless. You know, either you get outside the city limits or we arrest you and send you to jail. Problem solved. We don't need to invest in any of these other support structures because we have these private prisons we can send you to. We know you're not a violent offender. You're just you're just being uh, criminalized because you're unhoused. So we're going to send you to that private prison that's low security. And we're just going to have full up uh, labor camps, essentially. Because that's the dirty secret of private prisons in America. They're, they are slave labor camps. That's why, that's why the 13th Amendment has like a provision allowing for slavery as punishment for a crime. So like what's happening here is a redirection of homelessness into private prisons to serve the interests of capital to make them productive to capital. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be at the expense of taxpayers. We need to amend the 13th Amendment? Yeah, we needed to do it like the day after it was passed. Next will be debtors. Uh, unironically, Mr. Miyagi, that's... That, that is, like, part of the Republican wet dream. True, and young black economists, it's not even just the private prisons. It's just the private prisons lobby the U.S. government, you know? But the public prisons aren't any better. The public prisons also do slave labor. It, it's... Yeah, they, they want to bring back the, the debtor's prison... Which is effectively what uh, criminalizing homelessness is. It's just, you're, you're just putting people into jail for being poor. I mean, yes, we should also ban corporate lobbying. I, we, I just don't have like a path for that, unfortunately. We, we need to build progressive power before we start making wish lists like that. Disgusting and insane that slave labor is still a thing. Yeah, it's crazy. It's one of the least talked about problems in America right now. It disgusts me. You should have thought of that before you became peasants. Yeah, unironically. Unironically, that's the position of SCOTUS. Should we come prepared with stats? How do we prepare to be listened to if we don't have the gumption of a waspy nimby? Honestly, Alex JT, if you go to your local town halls and like city council meetings, it's okay for you to just sit there, learn how things work, and not say anything for like the first couple meetings. That that's totally acceptable cuz you need to learn how your local government works before you can know what levers you need to press to get things done, you know? The absurd part is it'll cost the government more to imprison them than it would cost to house them, but imprison their useful laborers. Exactly, Sylvia Rusty Fay. Exactly. Their labor and the profit from their labor can be used to benefit their wealthy friends. Essentially. <sighs> At character creation, I put all my points into int and riz. I should have put all my points into generational wealth. Yeah. You fools. When I was first homeless, I was a minor, and it was a nightmare living in a shelter with me and my dad, but it would have been worse being on the street. Yeah, that's the other thing. Like, talk about the school-to-prison pipeline, but, like, so many children are homeless. D does this mean they're going to have criminal records by virtue of, like, being born into a poor family? Like, that's insane. That is actually insane. Uh, like, it's almost like overnight creating an entire, uh, like, an entirely new underclass in our society to be exploited as, like, slave labor, essentially. What is the minimum net worth you would consider to be upper class? $4 
for upper class? I don't know. I'd, I'd say like a quarter mil, maybe. Although net worth also includes like homes. I don't know. Maybe maybe like half mil. I don't know. Actually, no. That would probably just be upper middle class. I guess maybe a million dollars. Like, I I think part of the issue is that like upper class in American society include is basically like people with unimaginable levels of wealth. Like there are a lot of people who are like middle class who I think might have like what I would consider like a fuck ton of money, you know? I'm not allowed to fed post. Yeah, no fed posting. <sighs> High middle class lifestyle, 10 million. And if you want a mansion or yacht or Ferrari, a 50 million net worth would suffice. I mean, I feel like if you have a $10 million net worth, I would, I would, I would say that is upper class. Um, the vast majority of people in America can't even conceive of having a million dollars, let alone 10 of that. Like I know, I know right now sitting here thinking about like what I would do with a million dollars. That's more money than I can conceive of spending. You know, that is supposed to last you for the rest of your life. Wait, what? I didn't, I didn't get that part of the hypothetical. I, I only got what I consider upper class. I, I don't know. My, my, my opinion is that like you, you should still work. <laughs> I couldn't even imagine having 10K. Yeah. The bare naked ladies knew what to do with a million dollars. Was it a million dollars worth of bare naked ladies? Also, I don't, I don't know music. Were the bare naked ladies li actual ladies? Because that sounds like a cool subversive, subversive go girl band, you know? They burned it all. Oh, that they, they were not. Well, then that's a terrible name. False advertising. I'm going to sue. <laughs> Rich is having enough money that you could spend it freely for the rest of your life without having to worry about running out. I disagree with that definition, I guess, but, you know, that that's fine. It's just a semantic uh, disagreement. They were Canadian? Damn, okay. Anyway, uh, this this ban on homelessness or this, sorry, this ability to ban homelessness, I'm sure it's going to make folks like Anna Kasparian quite happy, you know? You know, it's going to clean up the streets, but it's basically going to create shanty towns outside of, outside of city limits. You're, you're basically setting the stage for creating Hoovervilles and, like, further in, entrenching systemic, like, slavery, you know? Yeah, Anna of the Young Terps, yeah, exactly. So monsters, yeah, this is a monstrous court case that's going to have massive ramifications for, especially outside of the largest cities in America. You're basically going to create like, I, I don't know, like shant, like shanty suburbs. It's it's going to be weird, and it's going to be not healthy for the body politic. I didn't even think about disabled people. There's so many layer, layers to this issue. Yeah, like. People who are disabled or who are disadvantaged because they're discriminated against for being like black or Muslim or like trans or gay. Like those people all still exist right now. And like if you fall through the cracks and you happen to be in or near cities that are eyeing these types of bands, like you you're like a bad day away from getting absolutely fucked, you know? 
so many people in America are just like one bad day away from being homeless. And it's, it shouldn't be that way in the wealthiest country on earth. <sighs> yeah, er Erica in chat, disabled, trans, and homeless. And Erica, let us, you know, let, it, let us know if you need, need help, okay? I know, I know that there are a lot of people in this community who would go to bat to, for you, like, no questions asked. <coughs> Half of homeless youth are queer because their parents throw them out. This is criminalizing queer kids. Well, yeah, but Republicans don't care about queer kids, and frankly, Democrats don't care that much about queer kids either. All right? It, it, it sucks. That's fascism. If you don't contribute to the state, you can die. I mean, it's both fascism and capitalism, right? Like, that's, that is the fundamental premise of capitalism as it's been traditionally conceived, right? Like, if you aren't productive, you die. That, that's the, the fundamental premise of capital. And over time, we've shaved off some of those sharper edges with, like, philanthropy and, like, government intervention. But... Republicans want to bring back all of the sharp edges and Democrats are too feckless to really oppose it. So we get like this system where they want to keep the knife at your throat to force you to do labor, you know, otherwise you're going to suffer and die. That's the, that's the fundamental premise of capitalism. That threat is there to coerce you into doing or dying. And they don't really care that much which. Remind, reminder that the Mormon church not only excommunicates queer children, but excommunicates their families if they don't disown them. That's, I actually didn't know that. That's crazy. In unrelated news, Utah has the high rate, highest rate of youth homelessness in the country. That's fucked, man. God. Yeah, in a again, it's Pride Month, but we got we got we do we do need to highlight stuff like this. Trans and gay kids like get kicked out of our homes at like such a huge rate. It's why so many kids are afraid of coming out to their parents and why they choose to come out to teachers or other trusted adults rather than their parents first. And it's why like uh mandatory reporting uh imposed on teachers to parents is extraordinarily fucked up because it can lead to direct abuse of children. It can lead to them being kicked out of their homes. It's, it's really, really bad. <sighs> okay. Now we have to, we have to talk about the last bit. OK, this is going to be the hardest one. So just compose yourselves. The Supreme Court today. Also struck down the Chevron doctrine. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Chevron doctrine, it basically stems from a 1984 decision uh, in the case Chevron v. Natural Resource Defense Council. Now, this court case it's a bit, I mean, it was considered a bit obscure, but it has grown in prominence over the years because it's basically what allows the EPA to do what the EPA does, the Environmental Protection Agency. Completely? Yes, Kitsune Cavalier, completely. So the Chevron Doctrine, for those of you who don't know what it is, is essentially the idea that Congress has the ability to define uh, environmental regulations. But in the cases where Congress hasn't passed explicit laws, the Chevron Doctrine says that the EPA has the ability to assign, uh, you know, different 
things in the name of public health, things like, um, you know, limiting parts per million of different chemicals in the water or uh, limit parts per million of emissions or uh, do like bits of like where where companies can drop waste, et cetera. Like this is. Ev like all that it's the bedrock of basically all of the protections that keep companies from poisoning your water, poisoning your air. Uh, and poisoning your soil, okay? It is basically the the reason the EPA is able to do the things it does. Um, and what take what overturning Chevron doctrine means is essentially that instead of the EPA, you know, a, a group of regulatory experts that have access to information setting those limits. That is now going instead to each individual judge. Every time a company attempts to challenge any kind of regulation, it the law the law then gets to be interpreted by the judge. So instead of having a regulatory body full of experts setting like the limit for, say, lead in gasoline or um, you know, how much carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide is healthy for people to breathe. Um, you are now going to have uninformed judges who only know the law. And those judges are going to get lobbied by these corporations. They're going to get kickbacks. They're going to get um, bought and paid for by these massive corporate industries. And... It's horrifying. If you if you have had any ideas, by the way, of limiting emissions, for example, to fight climate change, this is this is the death of that. Um, yeah, take care, OS Crane, and remember, we're we're gonna we're gonna roll up our sleeves and fight against this stuff uh, in the election, but like. Definitely, t today is definitely a day where you can take a moment to just, like, scream fuck in the middle of the woods as loud as you can. So, but why are they doing shit like this? Because corporations want to be able to pollute your water. They want to be able to pollute your soil. They want to be able to pollute your air. They want to be able to put even more microplastics in you. They want to do it because it's cheaper for them to get it, get rid of that waste in unsafe ways than it is for them to get rid of it in safe ways. The reason we have these regulations, it, it puts more cost on the company to get rid of these things the right way in ways that aren't as harmful to the environment. So they make more money when they are allowed to be less safe. It's the same way that like, if you don't have like worker protections, then like you get companies that are like, yeah, just put your hand into the, into the, the baler, you know, it's jammed, you know, you got a 50, 50 chance of losing your arm, but you know, it's cheaper for us to do that rather than stop the entire, uh, you know, production line or whatever, you know, to, to shut the entire machine down. So, I think Paladin Lost is a bit behind on the stream. But, it, yeah, no, it, it's basically, and, and this is part of the evil of capitalism, right? It's that you have, you know, the bottom level people, the workers, then you got managers, then you got managers for the managers, and 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 then suddenly you have, like, this group at the top, the CEOs, the, the shareholders, and they are so abstracted from the labor that it doesn't matter to them that, like, people on the production floor of the factory or in the fields are going to suffer and die and lose limbs, that, like, child laborers are going to, like, be losing their hands in, like, the ice cream machine that is shoddily made. It doesn't matter to them about those things because they're only looking at the spreadsheets and they see that when you cut the regulations, their spreadsheets look better. When you cut the regulations, their investors like that because it means, you know, their investors know, Oh, less regulation, less, uh, less cost. We can pass that on to our shareholders. We can pass on those profits. That's, 
that's that's the that's the evil of capitalism. It's not that there are like greedy people in in shadowy dark rooms rubbing their hands together going, "Yes, we will make them suffer and they will and they will make us more money." Like it's not like that. They're just looking at spreadsheets. You know, that's that's at the end of the day what they're doing and the evil of it is how abstract it it is. And maybe you get some evil motherfuckers like that from time to time, but like they're not the norm. You know? Do they know the microplastics are in their water as well? They they know, they just don't care, you know? They either don't care or they just like drink like their own like special water that's only for rich people, you know? It's uh this is not fun right now. Yeah. It, it, I agree. This today's a bad day, guys. Is that special water the same one Biden is selling? M maybe, guys. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. This ruling is going to make Project 2025 a lot easier to enact. Yeah. 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 But the thing is, and I, I know that this is all awful to talk about. I know it's awful for you guys to hear, but we need to be aware of it because this is. Uh, this is this is like a, a land, like a, a land shift. That's not that's not a, that's not a phrase. This is a landmark change in policy yeah they're, they're gonna be there's gonna be judge shopping there's gonna be wooing whining and dining of judges you know they drink the same water oh alan smith they don't drink the same water i can i i can guarantee you they don't drink the same water you and i do so uh here's here is scotus blog Supreme Court strikes down Chevron curtailing power of federal agencies. Okay. When the Supreme Court first issued its decision on the Chevron case more than 40 years ago, the decision was not necessarily regarded as particularly consequential. But in the years since then, it became one of the most important rulings on federal administrative law, cited by federal courts more than 18,000 times. This case has been so, like, prolific legally that it's basically become the bedrock for our ability to manage our, our ecosystems. Like, guys, before we had the EPA, we had acid rain. Acid rain was a big problem in American cities before we started managing, like, comp like, like how companies emitted... Uh, pollution into the environment. Rivers were literally catching fire. Exactly, Shrug and Bug. Can I get a video of... Uh... Can we get a video of this? Yeah, here's the Ohio EPA. They put together this video. On that particular bridge where the fire was, there's the rail cars hauling molten steel from the JNL plant over to the rolling mills. And they all stand sparking 90 oil and the debris at the base of the bridge. The noise was deafening, the air was choking, and the river, just depending on what day you were there, there was oil, there was pickle liquor, it was flowing orange, red, and uh, just all, it, 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 was, it was almost an alien environment. This is, this is what happens when we don't have an EPA that is empowered to actually combat this stuff. Like, 
Republicans have poisoned the idea of regulations to the point that people are like, oh, yeah, it's really good that we're disempowering the EPA. With, with environmental regulations, we fixed holes in our atmosphere. We were able to do that. We were, we were able to fix these rivers that were catching on fire. Uh, like, guys, I've talked about this a bit on stream, but one of the radicalizing moments for me in my life was playing, um, was actually playing a video game. And it was playing the video game Frostpunk. And the sequel for that is coming out soon, and I'm going to play it on stream. But Frostpunk is basically a, a, a city management game set in an environmental apocalypse. It's a very, it's a different environmental apocalypse than what we are currently living through, but, you know, uh, still the, the parallels exist. And it really hammers home, through its gameplay, the threat of embracing eco-fascism. And that was one of... The, uh, honestly, that was the moment where I was like, oh, the United States could easily fall to that. Could easily fall to that. Maybe I need to get involved. Maybe I need to start talking more about politics. Maybe I need to start doing something. Because this threat is on the horizon. I can see it. We need to do something about it. What is ecofascism? Ecofascism is essentially like the idea that in order to cope with climate change, you need to, like, the, the idea is that you need to transition to fascism. Fascism becomes a more attractive, like, fascist authoritarianism becomes a more attractive governing structure the more dire your, 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 your uh, ecological situation is. You know, oh, we need to kill people off in order uh, for us to uh, support our society. You know, uh, the idea that like uh, worsening climate change will push uh, climate change refugees around in the United States and also out from outside the United States. And that's going to empower these more authoritarian conservative tendencies about border, the immigration, et cetera. And it's going to create a lot of uh, a lot of people that don't have a strong sense of place because the places they're from aren't livable anymore. And though all of those pressures coalescing into an authoritarian fascist state. Um, yeah, exactly. Snookin, you will eat the sawdust. Why would you, why would we need fascism if our environment is collapsing? Because people are going to turn to strong men when our current states fail, that's why. Like, pe people are going to turn to fascist dictators when they feel like the existent system has failed them. And to be clear, the existent system has failed people. It's why our planet is currently dying. So... Yeah, when people feel these existential pressures, that's when fascism becomes a more uh, a more attractive prospect. And unfortunately for America, that's really bad. If you think <laughs> like like America falling to fascism, a nuclear powered fascism as we rumble towards apocalypse is is real real bad. It's real, real bad, guys. Yeah, like, I mean, and Nestle trying to monopolize water, that, that, it's another symptom of capitalism. That, that's, like, a way our system has currently failed us, you know? That's Mad Max level shit right there. Yeah. It had its own unique smell, and uh, a big cleanup tool for an oil spill was a squeegee, and shove it all off into the river. But remember, all of this was before the Federal Water Pollution Control Act 
of 1970 and 1972. Hell yeah, hell yeah, brother. Let's get Trump into office. We need to have all of our rivers burning by 2036, okay? So all of that was quite legal, what was being done to make a mess in the river. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. You know, you could just dump oil into uh, public water supplies back, back in the 70s before there were, you know, regulations against that. Time Magazine captured an image and that really led people to say, no more, we, we need to do something about this. So it was just getting enough political will to address this and, and really start with the industries that had to I thought eco-fascism was the only way to save the environment is call the undesirables and useless eaters. Well, yeah, but that's the thing, right? My rear end? Eco-fascism is ostensibly about saving the environment, but it's also about keeping people safe, safe, you know, from like the ecological changes, you know, providing like some semblance of stability. And you do that by culling the undesirables and useless eaters and like, you know, uh, mowing down immigrants, uh, et, et cetera. Like that's, that's the premise of the ideology. The ideology is both, we need to save the environment, by doing fascism, we need, and by doing fascism and saving the environment, we also save the good ones, you know? Turn their back on the river. That was, that was pretty shocking. Again, no Fed posting in chat, please. No Fed post posting in chat, please. Um, like I said, uh, you know, I, I was hired by the agency to clean this river up, and I remember having some thoughts about it. <laughs> it might be hopeless, you know. There were days. Why, why is it so hard to swing away from evil? Uh, because a lot of evil things have a you know monetary incentive. The profit motive is a powerful thing under capitalism. Because a lot of people are going to do a lot of shitty things to make sure that they're not the ones at the very bottom of the uh, economic, uh, you know, hierarchy. Because as we've seen, thanks, Supreme Court, it's now you, you're now able to just be put in jail for being too poor to own a home or rent a home. I really wondered whether we we're, we're going to be able to make any progress at all down in an area like that. There was a group put together called the Oil Study Group, and it was made up of all the people that handle oil on the river. Everybody became, let's say, good corporate citizens and did their part to try and study this thing and see how we could clean it up. When we first sat down, some of the very first... If this continues to worsen, where can I go? Uh, I don't know, the, mid the Midwest of America is going to be pretty safe. App meetings that we had. It stands for Remedial Action Plan, and this came out of the International Joint Commission, which was a commission. Yeah, exact, exactly. You you fight you fight fascism. You fight fascism however you can. You fight them in the courts. You fight them electorally, and as a last resort, you fight them in the streets. Set up between the United States and Canada initially to deal with border disputes, but water quality became such an issue in the late 60s and early 70s. They took on the role of uh, water quality. We had members from the Sierra Club. We had LTV Steel, and we had the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. I mean, there were a lot of different perspectives on what they want and what they felt was needed for the river. People- yeah, this is this is in Ohio, yeah. Had their shields up, and people were guarded during the first few meetings, but as they went on, I noticed people started, you know, a lot went on getting coffee in between the breaks and people talking on the side, and hey, this guy's not so bad. He's not really the enemy getting one another to listen to one. Can folks in Flint drink their water yet? Yes. The, the answer is yes, it is technically safe. But I wouldn't drink the water in Flint. Another and better understand that, uh, that that's a real important part of that process. We had a Clean Water Act, the, the first version of the Clean Water Act, and EPA was formed both nationally and at the state level. Coincidentally, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, then the Cleveland Regional Sewer District, was formed to tackle broad issues. When rivers are burning, things are bad. 
<laughs> you, you don't you don't say. Anyway, uh, hey, you know what? This looks like a lot of fun, though. You know, you get people out shoot, shooting water at big fires on the river. It builds character. OK, we, we used to build we used to build men better. You know, uh, we need to get more of these conservative men out there fighting the fires on rivers. And, you know, we don't have any we don't have enough rivers on fire these days to build that character. So we're bringing them back, bringing them back. Thanks, SCOTUS for allowing this to happen again. So basically a civil war. There's not going to be a civil war in America. That That's LARPy bullshit. There wasn't an understanding of what we could do to make it better. We did not have any of the technologies that we had now. And that's one of the important things. The levels of lead are low enough in most water sources in Flint to not affect adult and adult too much. Take that as you will. Hmm, that, that does not sound like a ringing endorsement. Things about the cleanup of the river is that we had to develop an education system where we actually trained technicians on what to do. We had to do research in terms of what to find out what could be done and these processes got better over time so we had to invent a whole new set of clean water infrastructure uh, in order to clean up the river and we also had to pass a bunch of regulations to force companies to stop pouring oil into it weirdly enough a lot of the improvement, I think, can be attributed to a few things. Obviously, a lot of investment by the sewer district, $5 billion, more than $5 billion, since we were formed. Other investments by other communities, city of... Can, can I just also point out here that when they're casually talking about getting $5 billion invested into this project, that's $5 billion of taxpayer money that is only being spent because private companies dumped all of their uh, waste into the river. So public money has to be used to clean up privately created problems. And like, that's, that's, that's how it goes. You know, like you, uh, you privatize the gains and then when it comes time for the public to pay the bill, the taxpayer foots it. Akron and surrounding we communities. Put it. There's been investment, environmental investment, to help clean up things and make things better in terms of water quality. Industrial discharges became regulated under the Clean Water Act. We play a role. We are kind of the EPA uh, for the what we call a pretreatment program. Industries need to clean up their waste streams before they discharge to us. And that's really helped as well. So there's been sustained investment. Thank you. I was trying to remember the phrase Rainbow Krampus, privatize the gains, socialize the losses, exactly. Over time. I think so often in the environmental community, you know, it's kind of a bummer, right? So folks see mistakes and we talk about climate change and people feel like there's a lack of progress. But when you come to Cleveland and you go to the Cuyahoga River and you walk along the east banks of, of the flats, you can see it. You can smell it, and it's a huge improvement. But you're not going to see stuff like the flats on a river that's full of oil. So that really stimulated some of the economic things. And there's another uptick going on right now, and I think that's great. Um, the Metro Parks has taken control of certain areas. You got a restaurant on the river. The thing that amazed me about Cleveland is no restaurants on the lakefront. Why is that? Because things were bad, but we're starting to see that. Uh, we've got kayakers on the river. You know, St. Ignatius and other high school teams are sculling on the river. It's all good. There's a lot of boating interests, particularly sport fishing, you know, going on. So there's all of these are quality of life enhancements. I think the biggest victory is that we have fish in the river and we have people utilizing the river. We have freighters going up and down. There's more and more people trying to access the river, but not just the human use, but we do have that good enough health to have teams of fish that are swimming up and down the river. People partying at the East Bank or going to a concert 
um, in the flats. Shiny, new, colorful, fun, exciting. It's not just the bridges that have color. The valley now is colorful. Yeah, it's easy for it to be colorful when it's not, you know, covered in sludge. And, uh, when it's not covered in sludge and on fire. I, I would imagine it's helpful for, like, it to look verdant and green when it's not constantly catching on fire. I mean, fire is a color. Touche. Touche. And that's not something you find in a dirty old industrial valley. It's definitely a model for environmental protection. My colleagues at Ohio Environmental Protection Agency talk about how they're visited by teams of people from all over the world um, because they- What that tour, dude? Thank you for gifting Carly a sub. I appreciate that. Had heard about that, that last burning of the river and how it started the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Clean Water Act. So it's a model as far as getting those regulations and, and beginning to clean up the water. As people from both I just, it's so frustrating to me. And it, it makes me, it makes me want to cry, you know? Because I, I look at this and I see so much work being put in by so many people to like haul haul like our entire society and infrastructure into like a better a better direction you know and and they just keep putting these institutional barriers and like, yeah, it, all of that work over like half a century just being thrown in the garbage by this SCOTUS decision, it's insane. And I'm so, up, I, like, it's so frustrating, you know? Yeah, uh, Lady Wrinklehead, I, I heard about this, but I, I don't know what it means. Uh, Justice Samuel Alito was gone for two days last week, but like, I think he was present this week, so I'm not entirely sure what the, what the absence means. Yeah. No, he's, he's still alive, guys. He's, he's still alive. Don't, don't worry. Worry. Yeah, exactly, Carly. That's kind of where I'm at with it. Just all of these people worked so hard to make a river that's, like, livable for their children and grandchildren, and this SCOTUS decision completely guts the EPA. Completely, like, kneecaps our, our generation's attempt to, like have a livable world for our children Besides, um, and like granted it's not going to happen overnight like it's not like that decision was handed down and now instantly you know it's all of the rivers are on fire again but it's going to be like this slow degradation and we need to figure out a way to un un <laughs> you know unfuck it you know we need congress to take action on this and true it it like, the EPA is, like, just the main one I'm kind of focused on, but every, like, Chevron Doctrine applies very widely. <sighs> like, I, I, I don't know, like, It also is going to affect your health care regulations, like regulations that make different surgical interventions safe, anesthetics safe, you know, uh, the FDA. 
Like, holy moly, guys. Like, everything gets fucked by this. I just... This is going to... I mean, it's going to, like, quintuple or, like, you know, exponentially increase the number of legal cases going through the, the U.S. court system at any given time. Yeah, Chevron is overruled, Chief Justice John G. Roberts wrote for the majority. Courts must exercise their independent judgment in deciding whether an agency has acted within its statutory authority. This is, this is like, one of the big... This is setting up the biggest legal clusterfuck to ever exist in our country. <laughs> and I, I, I genuinely think that the only way we can do... Th we, the only way this gets unfucked is if uh, we get, like, a super majority and the Democratic nominee wins the presidency. Like, that's it. That's the only way. And that's even if, like, liberals care enough to try and change this. True, it's the biggest legal clusterfuck so far. <sighs> Can the Justice Department finally open bribery cases against Supreme Court justices? No, because they're literally above the law. The only people who can remove Supreme Court justices are Congress. And, like, Congress isn't going to do that. So we're just stuck. If Biden had a spine, he'd expand the uh, Supreme Court, but he doesn't. So we're stuck. Again, no Fed posting. No Fed posting. Must not Fed post. We talking about Democrats scrambling? We're talking about horrific SCOTUS rulings and how they're fucking all of us. At the uh, the one silver lining, guys, the one the one silver lining, okay, to all of this, is that at the very least, Chief Justice John Roberts said that uh, in in his ruling that um, regulations upheld by courts under Chevron are not subject to immediate challenge for that reason alone. So like. Legally, you can't challenge older cases that were upheld under Chevron. So, like, I guess that's good. But also, the court is kind of split on that. So I guess we'll find out when it inevitably goes to the Supreme Court whether or not they can overturn past rulings that were predicated on Chevron doctrine. This is worst case scenario. If you don't like a certain agency, just think of how much worse it will get when driven solely by political motivation. Yeah, when driven solely by political motivation and the end result is solely decided by the justice system. Insane. This just means there will be thousands of cases challenging every regulation not yet challenged in court. KBS. Yes, exactly. Companies have a lot of money to challenge a lot of regulations. I mean, like, God, even just, like, building codes. I, I, I bet this also affects, like... Uh, regulations for construction, like, are, are we going to have, like, towers that just collapse? I mean, we already have that in Florida, but, like, that can be, like, a, a new normal. Yeah, the FDA is a big one, too. Like, are we just going to get snake oil being passed through the courts to be approved by the FDA? That I, I, I genuinely don't know what the extent of this could be. There aren't a lot of federal building codes. Yeah, but like, I, I guess 
I guess my question is, could this also be brought down to, like, local and state levels? Because, like, this this could be real messy real fast. <sighs> cool. Thanks, capitalism. The river. Come down to know it. They start to love it. That is what we need going forward. With regards to the future and, and what's coming down the pike for the Cuyahoga River, one of our, our kind of near-term goals is the removal of the Gorge Dam in Cuyahoga Falls. That would return the river to naturally flowing stream between Akron and the mouth at Lake Erie and here in Cleveland. So on the Cuyahoga River, about halfway up-ish, there's a dam. It was uh, originally built in uh, the early 1900s as a hydro plant. So it never worked out as a, a functioning hydro plant, but the structure is still there, and it blocks river movement. How do you build, I, I'm sorry, how do you build a dam for hydro, uh, how, do you, how do you mess that up? Like hydroelectric power, we've, we've had that down for a real long time, guys. Movement, so it disturbs the system, impounds water. Taking it out, which would be an awesome thing, requires partnerships above and beyond just Ohio EPA, and the community has to support it. Our fish don't jump. They're not getting up past the gorge dam because they don't crawl. They don't jump, they don't fly, they don't crawl. So we have to remove the barriers. As an Ohioan, they can mess it up. Okay, fair. To fish population. That's life in a system. So restoration is life if we make it possible. The Gorge Dam is a, a hunk of concrete sitting in the middle of the river, creating probably the largest unresolved water quality issue on the Cuyahoga River. There is a dam pool behind it about a mile and a half long, and we do not meet water quality standards in that dam pool. So the opportunity here is to restore a mile and a half of water quality. This two mile section of the... Can I just say that the people who work at the EPA seem like really good eggs. Like they're just really enthusiastic bureaucrats who want to make sure nature's nice. And I think that's kind of wonderful. Like, I think, I, I just, I, I wish more people were like that, frankly. Cuyahoga River, the river falls over 200 feet. So we have this spectacularly beautiful geography, which provides an opportunity for tourism, um, even beyond what we experience now. It provides an opportunity for expert paddlers. Well, what we've done in the recent past is we Expert paddlers, smuggy face. We had two smaller dams that were removed. And what that did is that opened up about a half mile of challenging whitewater. And behind the Sheridan in our downtown, we have class five rapids. But soon you won't be able to give a dam. But now there's a larger portion for the kayakers to enjoy. However, when those dams came down, we had to install signs with the guidance of our law department it says extreme danger, get out here. That's where those kayakers get in for their competitive races. With the Class 5 Rapids, the, the large dam, the Edison Dam at the old power plant is still there. The kayakers tell me if that comes down, there will be two and a half miles of challenging whitewater in Cuyahoga Falls, and there's nothing even close to that east of the Mississippi. So we'll be building more restaurants and hotels just for that reason. What happened on the Cuyahoga River has benefited the entire world just because it put this, hey, water quality can get so bad. At that time with the news and what, what ended up happening was, yeah, this was the image. And we probably at some point should have been saying, hey, this isn't right. We <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> understatement of the century there. 
You know, at some point when there, when our rivers started catching fire, we probably should have been able to say, hey, that, that's not right. I feel like, I feel like that, yeah, no, no, that the first time it happened, you probably should have been able to say that, in fact. I feel like uh, your, your water catching fire is a really, really bad sign. We looked at the Cuyahoga River last year as part of what we call an assessment at EPA. And most of the main flowing part of the river meet the standards we have in Ohio. Uh, this guy is not being a very safe driver, though. He's texting and driving the car, the, the, the boat. Uh, and he's driving with his feet. Uh, this, is, this is very illegal activity. I think it shows how far we've come. And, and luckily so, because that could not continue the way it was. It was catastrophic to the waterway, to health, to the pollution, to dangerous situations, obviously, with a lot of the oil and things that were floating. So the fact that that's what finally it took, I, something catastrophic, to change our mindset, and we have. And even to today, we're still pushing forward to preserve nature as, as it was intended. Certainly I ain't no riverboat captain. Burning. Exactly. He's breaking riverboat etiquette. River. I know what it meant. That one dude was like, the rest of the river is fine, though. <laughs> right? And it burned. We have taken that burning river and turned it into a phoenix. Where we are right now is... No, no, don't. Don't compare the river to a phoenix. You guys have been you guys have been doing so good in this entire Phoenix is like burn and die and then they rise again to burn and die again. No, it, it's it's actually cyclical. The phoenix doesn't burn and then get reborn and then it's totally fine. It keeps doing that. Don't don't use that as the analogy. It's kind of a zenith. And so it's very important. Also, River Phoenix famously died young. Fuck, that's good. <laughs> Fuck, gay fish. <laughs> that, that's cold. <laughs> that's cold. For us to continue these values so that the zenith continues to improve. Good job, Ohio EPA. I'm sorry that the Supreme Court is undermining all of your hard efforts. Ay, ay, ay. She predicted the court ruling? Yeah, she did. So, guys. The court is absolutely fucked. And uh, these rulings today are abysmal. They're, they're, there's no sugarcoating it. These, these, are, these are regulations that will harm... Ev not regulations. These are rulings that will harm every American. Most people know someone who has been homeless or on the verge of homelessness... And now that not only are they staring down the actual like material harm that that can do, they're also staring down facing legal charges for being homeless. Not only that, some people who participated in January 6 might get let off the hook. And not only that, one of the foundational legal understandings of America has been undermined. And that is going to affect things like your prescription medication, your, uh, your local environment, uh, the ability to regulate um, any kind of, of industry, really. And it's, it's a dark day. And so one thing we can take from this, one thing we can take from this is that you guys need to get involved when it comes to this upcoming election cycle. I, I don't know if Joe Biden, like Joe Biden is, is in trouble right now, dog. He's, 
he he just gave like the worst debate performance in American history. He's old, he's weak, he's decrepit, he's feeble. And unfortunately, if he doesn't drop out, if he doesn't pull out for health reasons or because of political pressure, uh, then he's going to be the guy. And if he's our guy, we have to turn out because if we don't, it only prolongs the amount of time conservatives control the court. We need to make sure that next time a Supreme Court seat opens, we can get we can get a more liberal minded judge, a left leaning judge, because guess what? There's no more pretending all these people are impartial. They're trying the conservative dominated court is trying to undermine the very fabric of America, the very the very regulations and laws that keep all of us safe. And that is only possible if we have left leaning folks in the White House. That it, it really is. It really does come down to something that simple. We need to win on an existential level. And uh, I hope I hope these court cases really highlight what we need what we need to do going forward. Because if we if we shrug our shoulders now, if we give up now, if we just say, well, everything's everything's ruined, then we we're already dead. The thing we need to do is we need to roll our sleeves up and get to work. And I know that it it as lefties, as as socialists, as ancoms, as whatever. You identify on the left word side of the, uh, you know, uh, spectrum of political ideology. That is a bitter, that is a bitter pill to swallow. But we need to do anything and everything we can. In order to avert more of this, because this is devastating. This is devastating, guys. It really is an existential threat, not only to our lives, but to the lives of our children and our children's children and like the ability for us to live. It, 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 we're getting down to brass tacks. We're getting down to like this being a life or death kind of struggle. So. Let. Let this, I, I know a lot, of, a lot of you are angry, and you should be. Hold on to that. Like a hot coal in your heart, because we need to be angry, we need to get out there, and we need to be loud, and we need to make sure we do every single thing we can to make sure Donald Trump doesn't win and further prolong this conservative Supreme Court. While also, you know, of course probably doing a fascist takeover of America. I've, I've read Project 2025, but like on this alone, this alone would justify getting out there for democracy. But with everything else, we got, we got to do or die. I'm a fight for my nieces and nephews and godchild. Yes, Melee Ethos, exactly. Do it not just for yourself, but for every person you care about. And uh, I will be I will be helping to organize events, uh, hopefully come August. So if any of you are motivated to uh, get involved in in electoral uh, efforts, I, I will be helping to do that. So. Don't give up, have hope. Let's get to work.